I do not think you can come across a person with so much diversity as my guest today, Nikki Mirgafori. I had a happy childhood, very happy childhood, very loved, especially my mom, who is this amazing human being. Being an immigrant, actually, at an age of 16, at that point was the most challenging thing I had gone through. Other important thread in my life. So when I was an undergrad meeting my, my husband, and in 1998, uh, he lost his battle to cancer. Why do you think, Nikki, why do you think some of us go through those? Grief is the price we pay for love. Every hello, there is a goodbye. Divinity, goodness, love is not just outside of us, but not only are we it, but as we grow, it grows. Welcome back. I do not think you can uh, come across a uh, person with so much diversity as my guest today. My guest uh, is Nikki Mirgafuri, or uh, in Persian, it would be Mirgafuri, which uh, has grown up until age 16 in Iran and then immigrated to uh, the United States, uh, where she studied at Stanford, at uh, UCLA. She had a, uh, a PhD in computer science in uh, from UC Berkeley. Uh, she uh, then became a visiting professor in uh, the psychology department. And there is that side of her life that's highly enthusiastic about AI and knowledgeable of what's happening in technology, uh, specifically interested in ethics uh, of AI. But then there is the other side of her, which is an empowered teacher who holds a lineage in Revada Buddhism. Uh, she studied uh, all different kinds of Buddhism, felt connected uh, to uh, lots of the practices uh, from mindfulness to silent uh, meditations. She teaches uh, Buddhism, she teaches meditation, she teaches silent retreats. She's interested in meditation of uh, death. And she uh, basically brings together, perhaps a bit like I do, but a lot more, a, a, an interesting perspective of East and West, of science and spirituality, uh, that I believe is incredibly needed in the times of confusions we're about to embark on. So when I first knew that she existed, I was honestly delighted. I was like, that is definitely a person the world needs today. We got in touch and we, uh, and I got ready for a conversation that is definitely very timely for our time today. Nikki, I am incredibly grateful that you said yes for us to meet. I have a million and a half questions, so I hope you're ready. <laughs> uh, but also I have, I felt a hard connection to your path. Um, I felt uh, that you perhaps have had uh, to make very interesting decisions along your life to embrace such dichotomy almost, because it is it is well known that sometimes, uh, you know, or most of the time scientists will not have the time for spirituality and spiritual people will not have time for science. So t tell us a little bit about your journey, perhaps if, you, if you're even open to discussing uh, your childhood uh, growing up in Iran, I, I, you know, leaving as a teen could quite have a quite a, a big impact on a, on a person. So you start, tell us about you. Mm -hmm. First of all, deep gratitude and appreciation, uh, Mo, for um, your kindness, for inviting me on your um, podcast to have a conversation, and your generosity of heart. Really appreciate your generous words and introduction, and it's it's well it's deserved. lovely to to meet and connect with a like-hearted, not just like-minded, but like-hearted. Absolutely, person. yes. I just really appreciate the the diversity of of your interests and what you've done in the in the world and what you're continuing to offer and and do in the world for the benefit of many. So really, thank, really thank you. starting with deep appreciation. Thank you so much. I think it's absolutely mutual. Mm, thank you. So so now as I um let's see, where do I begin? My goodness. Okay. Um uh, my story. How many hours do you have now? I'm going to give, them, I'm going to give the cliff hours, notes. <laughs> the cliff hours. notes. <laughs> cliff notes version. <laughs> well, no, there are no, other no, things no, we want to talk time. about. Take your time. We're interested. <laughs> oh my goodness. 
Well, let's see. Um, so, so I was born in Tehran, Iran, and um, um, to a liberal Muslim family. Mm. And um, so, uh, what does that mean? It means that you know my you know my grandma uh, uh, who lived with us uh, prayed you know the, the five Muslim prayers every day, and so did my dad. And and then there was also a lot of partying. You know, there was a <laughs> lot of partying in our household. So yeah, <laughs> quite 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 liberal. <laughs> quite a bit more uh, common than people think, as a matter of fact. I mean, in Iran specifically, where it became quite bleak, uh, you know, uh, probably in your childhood, uh, it's it's difficult to allow that. But across the Muslim world, in, in, including in Saudi Arabia, to, nowadays, the, the modern Saudi Arabia, there is a lot more uh, appreciation to the fact that religion is not supposed to destroy your life that you're yeah. supposed to have a life within certain moral guidelines but that it's yeah. not against that i think yeah yeah true and i think what what became interesting um in iran is that i was around 10 years old when the islamic revolution yeah. happened and and uh and before that of course the society was very liberal mm -hmm. very westernized and and before and after that, um, it became really, um, gosh, it, uh, well, living through, yeah, yeah, living through the Islamic Revolution actually was very difficult, and living through the the uh, Iran Iraq War that that also had an oh impact God, on me. Yeah. I remember the times that the, that Tehran was being bombed, and we we would go into bomb shelters. But even before that, the revolution, the 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 fear, the angst, the anxiety, and all the the persecutions and prosecutions and and executions and just uh it was a t it was living in a time of fear and uncertainty mm. um and and as as there is this um expression um chinese curse may you live in interesting times <laughs> it was so a neat. very interesting time yeah. it, it just uh not to get into a lot of history but the impact of the history, what you read in history books as to what happens, revolution, and this person comes and this person gets executed. And then this, you know, uh, it's on people. It's on the people who are living through it day by day by day, such that, for example, to relate it to actually what we all lived through globally, the pandemic a few years ago, and there was this time of fear and uncertainty. And I remember uh, joking with my cousin, who's, who's about my age, and we grew up as best friends in Iran. We would say yes yeah this is this time of uncertainty and and it's difficult but we've already lived through a time that was even more uncertain yeah even more difficult like this is not our first rodeo um <laughs> yes so so that sense of uncertainty the world and a, a society a culture will will go through it and and and, and the world has gone through it so so um back to the thread so yeah so living through the islamic revolution and and the iran iraq war and and the thread that we're following i want to uh, just go back to that for a moment so living uh in iran i continue to live in iran for another six years um in, under the islamic revolution the the the, the, the rule of law and, and then at that point women had to wear scarf um scarves yeah. and cover themselves and the social liberties were quite limited alcohol was out loud etc cetera, etc cetera. and yet the parting that i mentioned in in our homes it actually became much Wider. more vibrant because yeah. much because there was nowhere outside to go and socialize there was no it was so limited so all these parties all these gatherings like every weekend basically um there would be a lot of mirth and joy. So, so all in all, I would say I had a happy childhood, very happy, very happy childhood, very loved um, by my parents, especially my mom, who was this amazing human being, this this force of nature, really, this force of nature, force of love. She was the matriarch of the family, very loving. So, I had a happy childhood in the midst of this this turmoil and this fear and 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 in many ways as we think about um john bowlby's john bowlby's attachment theory right as long as there is a loving presence there is a loving presence that loves you and you feel safe you can go out and 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 explore the challenges of the world don't impact you as much as if you didn't have that stable loving 
a stable base at home. So you left uh, when you were 16, you went to the U.S. Yeah, I came to the U.S. So at that point, moved to uh, Illinois. Mm-hmm. Urbana, uh, went to Urbana-Champaign, University of Urbana-Champaign, did my undergraduate in computer science. I was quite a nerd. Um, <laughs> I loved computer science. Yeah, we love nerds. Did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you say me too? Did I hear that? I'm not, I wasn't quite sure. But um, did my undergrad there. And um, and actually, I, uh, just for completeness, I came actually before I had finished high school. So I finished the last year of high school in uh in in DeKalb, Illinois. And and uh, thinking your question earlier, this uh or maybe it was when we were chatting before we started the formal conversation. Um being an immigrant actually at an age of 16 at that point was the most challenging thing I had gone through wow. uh, in my life. Hmm. Uh maybe all of what happened in Iran aside um leaving friends family yeah, everything age, everyone yeah. and at that age and i actually moving to a small town and dekalb was not it was a small town and and there were some um yeah um some people who were not very welcoming I to imagine. a young girl from iran so yeah, that just imagine. made it all even more difficult a lot more difficult and lonely and and yeah very very yeah and and another thing is that when you're when you're young, you don't quite have the skills, you don't have the tools, you don't have the stability, you don't have the know-how. And and at that time, when I'm assuming we were around the same age, perhaps when when we were in our teens, there was no internet. There was a... you're forty years younger. So, <laughs> and, and always, always shall be. <laughs> Good one, Mo. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's funny. If you um, if you yeah. were ten around, you're you're probably younger than I am. But anyway, let's keep it that way. Yeah, yes. yeah. But, mm -hmm. uh, in the old days, there was yes. no internet and resources, and getting resources were quite difficult. And nowadays, there's so many resources. And thank heavens, thank thank goodness, there's so many resources for people going through various things to actually resource themselves to nourish themselves. So, so. Gosh, um, picking up things. Uh, so, so we're in Urbana Champagne. I've got my bachelor's, and I do have to add something else because another part of my path. I mean, there have been uh, some pivotal events, and another pivotal event is that I I um, met and fell in love with with my husband at the time in in University of Illinois, and then moved to to Boston um, because he was diagnosed with cancer at the time after mm -hmm. I finished, after I ended uh, my undergrad. So so we had a long, uh, while I was in Illinois uh, finishing school, uh, we had a long distance relationship. I moved, we got married, um, then together moved to California uh, uh, and, um, and I started graduate school at Berkeley. Um, in computer science, actually, uh, in AI, spe uh, specifically in AI. And my specialty was uh, speech and speaker recognition. We can talk more about that later. So working on AI before AI was cool. But anyway, so this other thread was, so um, the winter of AI, and I'm sure you know about the winter know, of AI. Of course, yeah. yeah, so yeah. So, um, and so, so uh, this other thread, it's very other important thread in my life. So when I was an undergrad meeting my my husband um, and moving with him, and, and he actually, he was also a computer scientist. So he had got his PhD at Illinois when I was an undergrad. So we moved to the Bay Area together, San Francisco Bay Area, and I was going to grad school, Berkeley, and he was working in Silicon Valley. And, um, and in 1998, uh, he lost his battle to cancer. Uh, so so it was an eight-year battle with cancer that he had. So we li we loved each other through that, and and that's been a very significant part of my life experience. Yes. Um, mortality, mortality, meeting meeting mortality. Uh, when I was twenty-eight, he he died when I was twenty-eight years old, but uh, facing the prospect of losing him uh, at 
age 20 and living with that, living with that every day and trying not to think about that, but being very present here and now, here and now. Let's not think about what future can bring or take away. Here and now, let's enjoy this precious life that we have together. So that was that was quite a training. That was quite a training, mind training. I didn't realize. Why, why do you think, Nikki? Why do you think some of us go through those? Oh, 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 oh. I'm so glad you asked because that's the question I asked myself when he died. So I asked myself, here's how I framed it. It was the, it was the um, name of this book by, by a rabbi which I read cover to cover. Why do bad things happen to good people? That I was- I remember that book, yeah. You remember that book? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and actually that around then, I think around, um, so I wondered about this question. So let, let's, let's stay with this question because I've thought about this and I, I know and trust that you have too. That, you know, having been raised as a, when a, good Muslim girl and thinking about God and being a good person and doing good deeds, et cetera, et cetera. I had a, a limit to, to me now. I had a limited vision of life, world, goodness, actions. So as I was going through my uh, um, late husband's illness and, and seeing him suffer, seeing him suffer so, so much through treatment and bone marrow transplant and just the, the the difficulty of it. And then when he died, I essentially became an agnostic and I was angry that if, you know, I don't want to believe in a God at that point, in a God that would do something like this. That was my perspective at that point. That was my limited perspective of, of um, you know, God as someone whom you would pray to and would answer your question, uh, answer your requests, and yeah. and um, and if you're good, you'll be rewarded on earth and in heaven, and if you're bad, you would be punished. It just that was my conception. That would that's what I had been taught. So so basically, at that point, I decided I was an agnostic. If if there was a God question. Um, uh, it it didn't matter enough. I didn't want to be an atheist. That for me, it seemed a bit too, uh, it's not my nature, but it's like, you know, it's, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to live my life, be a good person. There may be a God, there may not be a God, doesn't matter. Why do good, good and bad things happen? So the philosophy I came up with at that point was, excuse the language, S-H-I-T, happens. It just happens. Things happen to people in life. It just happens. It's the random. Things happen. There's no reason for it. And it's not that you did this and it, there's no, things happen. So I developed this personal philosophy that, you know, you, things happen. It's It's being part of human life. And then years later, I'll tell more, to, tell you more about how I found Buddhism, but let's just connect it to this in a moment. And years later, when I actually started to to um, uh, hear about Buddhist teachings and hear about the Four Noble Truths, Correct. that yes, there's suffering in the world, there are challenges, there's difficulty, there's pain and there's sorrow. It's just part of life. It happens. It was such a sigh of relief that it's not me. It's not as if I have done personally something wrong or there's something special about me who suffers in this great big way of losing someone I dearly adore. Like This is part of human life. We love, we lose. It's, it's loss and gain and gain and loss and fame and disrepute and pain and pleasure, the eight worldly wins, as as the Buddha talks about the eight. Um, I'm missing two, but I'm sure they'll come to me. But just like it's it's part of part of life. That's all of this is part of life. And 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 the nuances of suffering and stress and loss, it's part of life. Ah <sighs> so for Isn't me it? that was a huge exhale. Like yes, it's can I accept that? I'm not the only one. You know one. what I find really, really, really interesting is specifically death of a loved one is a very, very difficult a test. It's a big part of suffering, but somehow we personalize it. It's like, I'm the only one who's going to lose a loved one. Like, who, where, where do you live? Everybody loses a loved one and everybody loses 
of course, they wouldn't notice if it wasn't someone that was very dear, right? And, you know, yeah, maybe in my case, it came at a time where it's a little unexpected to lose a child compared to losing a father. But in your case as well, you know, it's a, it's a little unexpected to lose a loving 28-year-old husband, right? But But for everyone, sooner or later, and I keep asking myself that question frequently, it's like, okay, hold on. So if Ali lived another 10 years, would I be okay with it? Like, you know, if 10 years later he left our world, would I go like, yeah, now that's good. Yeah, good. No suffering now. It's, it's just part of life. Whenever he would leave, I would still struggle, right? Whenever my lovely daughter would suffer, I would struggle. It's, it doesn't matter if it's today or tomorrow or 10 years ago. It's, it's just part of how life is. It's, you know, life is not against me in a way. It's just running. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. It's it's the comings and goings that that we take so personally and <laughs> it, right? Yeah. Um and and of course grief is the price we pay for love and it's okay. Grief is okay. And, and that yet, is such a profound statement because I'm actually writing about this right now. Grief mm -hmm. is the price we pay for love, even if it's a breakup, right? Mm -hmm. Eventually, sooner or later, most love will, one party is going to lose the other somehow. I mean, think about it. That's Absolutely. It. Yeah. Every every hello, there is a goodbye. Every hello, there is every hello. I mean, of course, there is a goodbye. Duh, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's It's... Every beginning has an ending. It's mm -hmm. every arising, there is a passing, every, every, every. And we we don't want we turn our, our turn away from it because oh we're attached. We want it to be another way. And it's that wanting it to be another way. It's like Arr! whereas what what I've loved and and really appreciate about about the Buddhist teachings um is that. Yes, enjoy. Hold it with an open hand. Oh, here is this pen. Okay, so I can hold this pen ah, with an open hand, knowing that it's a lovely pen and at some point I might lose it or we'll stop writing. Can I enjoy it while it's, can I love it, really appreciate it without clinging to it, without like, I, I want this pen and then get rope burn. Like, here's <laughs> another symbol. You're like, oh, rope. when it goes like, no. Oh, Right, you get rope burn when you're holding on to a rope, and it just keeps going. So, can we really appreciate, enjoy, love what is? Because many of us actually don't love what is. We're like yeah. looking around, we're looking for what's next, yeah. the next thing, the next yeah. thing, and we just miss what's right here. So, it, this incredible. is profound training. It's profound training. At twenty eight, you you were at the time you were still studying, or did you have your PhD by then? I had six months of my dissertation to finish. Oh wow! So he, mm. so he died. Yeah, and and he was thirty seven. By the way, he was a little older because he had finished his his uh, PhD at, at University of Illinois. But still, very long, young, and you know, I'm so far past the age he was when he died, and and that's not lost on me to to be carrying on, um, but but continuing the thread of this life that carries the thread of many lives um he um uh, yeah so so he died three six months before i had finished so i decided this is it i just have to finish i'm not just doing it for myself but i'm doing it for him because that was something that 12 of us really looked forward to my my graduation mm. so so i finished my phd and and um and then um started to work at in at a startup in Silicon Valley in speech recognition and then the other thread begins. Here's the other thread. So so now the thread is about maybe about a year. Was it about a year? So when did I um so I, I love to hike and camp. I still do to be in nature. And um and I went to Peru for a trek. And on that trip, I was bit by one bug that gave me one unique virus, and about, so which weakened my immune system. And about a year after that, so it was 2000, wait, 
let's see, 2001 and 2002. So this is a few years after I finished my PhD in 1998. Mm -hmm. um, so long story short, I, I got bit by a tick uh, and got Lyme disease in oh, 2002. Mm. Thank you. And I had no idea at the time. Nobody had any idea the, the uh, what had happened. You know, when I saw the ring on my leg, that the the um, uh, the tick was already gone. I never saw the tick that bit me, but I saw the ring on my leg, and I thought uh, that you know this is a spider bite. At the time, there was not a lot of knowledge about Lyme disease, so didn't make anything of it. Um, so I got really sick for about a year, really sick at the time when I was working. Um, and at that time when it, it felt like mono, if you're familiar with mononucleosis, like the exhaustion, the fatigue, mm -hmm. looking yellow, you can looking yellow and green. So I was so exhausted at the time. And I was still trying to, to work full time as a computer scientist, as a research scientist. Um, and at that time, a friend of mine, um, who had done meditation retreats, told me, okay, how about you do meditation retreat, a silent meditation retreat that can be really supportive to your mind, to your body. Um, and I was so desperate at the time, Mo, that for the social butterfly me, hey, not talk for 10 days. Okay, fine. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Whatever it is, I'll do it. So at that time, this this friend whom I'm still deeply grateful for, she took me to um, to uh, actually the place that now I'm I'm a teacher at at Inside Meditation Center in Redwood City to learn basic meditation instructions. Um, then she took me to a day long to a one day retreat at Spirit Rock Meditation Center, which is now I'm also a teacher. It's yes. kind of funny how these things go. You know, I'm one of the stewarding teachers there now. So I learned a day a day of meditation, and then within a few months, I signed up for my first ten day, which was actually the first ten day silent retreat, which was in a Joshua Tree. Um, in the desert, and it was a spirit rock meditation retreat that Jack Hornfield used to do every year. So Jack Hornfield was my first teacher, and he's become a friend and a mentor. So it was my first teacher, and I had no idea what I was doing at the time. I was just this beginning meditator. Um, so, so a footnote, actually, just um, a footnote. When I did that retreat, I realized actually that. The, the the training that I had done with with my late husband Robert, the just being present, being present, that that was a training. That wow, yeah, my mind was so knew how to be present, not to go to the future or the past, just right here. Like wow, I've already been doing this for such a long time. Mm. Yeah, and also together with 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 him, with Robert, we used to listen to guided meditations for. Um, and also I had practiced Herbert Benson's relaxation response, which is basically mindfulness of the breath, is breath meditation. So I had done that, those for many years to support myself, to support him. So so I realized, oh, I've done this before. This is this is not new. And yet the whole philosophy of it, the whole philosophy. And, and at first I was only interested in meditation. I was, I was going to Dharma talks on retreats because I'm, you know, I wouldn't skip them. I'm a good girl. I'm supposed to show up to Dharma talks and little by little listening to the philosophy. Um, it just transformed my mind and my, my, my life. And I'll say more about that. But something I want to, to share about that first retreat is the first retreat I went on was in 2003. And it was five years after my husband had died, the love of my life. And by that time I had done so much therapy support groups, journaling, you name it. Everything that was available in the canon, yeah. I had done. I go on this silent retreat, four days of silence, being with the breath, meditating, and a well of sadness, a well of sadness that nothing had touched before. Yeah, that was so deep that nothing had touched before. I was crying for four days more. Mm. And it what there weren't stories. There weren't stories. There wasn't a narrative. It was just tears. It was just sadness. Just four days of sadness. Just tears. 
Um, and then after the four days, and really it just felt like a spring that had unleashed, like a spring deep down in in the, the earth, unleashed with sadness, sadness. I just needed to to be reached. It needed to 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 uh, flow. And um, and then after four days, something miraculous happened. Um, the tears stopped, and I started to experience joy, happiness in the ways that I hadn't until he died. I remember at this place, it was called the Institute for Mental Physics. There were there were these swings, children's swings. I remember going on the swings, and just feeling joy soaring into the sky. Um, there was an empty ballroom, and I hadn't danced in in a while. Both I had been sick, and and just the grief. I remember there was an empty ballroom, and I used to love to dance, and I was jumping up and down, dancing to the sound of silence with joy. Oh, there was so much joy, and there was nothing, nothing specific. It was just joy coming forth. That. That spring of tears had to be reached, had to be cleared, and nothing had reached it until then. It was the silent meditation with, with just being with the breath that had settled my mind long and long and settled it well enough for the tears to flow, the sadness to flow, and for the joy, for the joy to just the joy of the sky and dancing and silence and the desert and the beauty and the flowers and the birds. It was just... Beautiful. Wow. Do, do, wow. Do, you think, do you think this is our nature? Is the sadness is supposed to to flow, but we distract the mind so it doesn't find a way out. Is that how it is? It's is it within us to cure, to heal those wounds, but we never give it the time? What, what, what's the power yeah. of a silent meditation? Why does that happen? Oh, it's gosh, it's um I've seen it so many times. Yeah. I just came back actually two days ago from teaching a seven day silent meditation retreat, or I was the co, mm. or I was the lead, uh, leading teacher, uh, coordinating teacher. And Mo, I witnessed that so many times for so many people. Yeah. So many people. There was it, it, just so many people. I'm thinking of, of someone on this retreat that. I cried really feeling how the pain that they hadn't accessed for so many years and they were not quite able to to do the practice of metta loving kindness for themselves holding themselves in love there was so much intense pain and in the, and after days of silent silence in this container and and, and just a a a guidance sitting together and guiding them they touched into this this grief that just unleashed with weeping 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 we and afterwards they said okay i think now i can do <laughs> now i can do loving yeah. kindness for myself now i can i can hold the pain now i can touch it you know it's what's funny is it works for me the opposite way i do i do lots mm. of silent retreats i i don't do the organized ones because i'm a freaking introvert um, <laughs> it really is interesting. I actually love time completely alone, right? Uh, and and sometimes, I mean, I don't go fully 100% silent, but I go silent the entire day other than 40 minutes a day uh, for 40 days in a row, okay? Mm. And, it, and it is incredible, incredible. It comes to me with the opposite, uh, you know, I don't get pain coming out. I get massive inspiration, incredible clarity, an overwhelming feeling of gratitude to have been given the gift of space to just be there, just be there and connect, of course, to nature, because it, it's only done. I mean, sometimes you can do it in your living room, everyone, but but you, but it definitely in nature is a, a totally different experience. And it's just beautiful. And I, I, I yeah. ask the question because I believe people are depriving themselves of one of the biggest gifts that you can ever be given, which is a moment of silence to connect deeply to who you are. Yeah. 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 It's, it's all, not just a moment of silence. And, and, and as I hear more, yeah. you do, you connect with silence continuously. There's something about the continuity Absolutely. that settles the mind Absolutely. that really, really settles the mind. Yeah. And I would also 
um, and uh, like to say that um, I value and respect and, and love hearing that that you know, for example, you do the, the immersing yourself in nature, which is so healing, connecting with our na nature outside, nature inside, mm. and and also there's something as I found with the with the organized uh, retreats. There's something about the common humanity, something I about there's something about the common humanity that every that all of us are doing this sitting and walking in silence eating in silence all of, there's something different so as much as i Probably i'm right. bowing to your to your uh did you say introverted i i would i would lovingly invite you i would lovingly challenge that introverted side to consider perhaps something a little different to see and also there's something about um the i would say the support the support that's offered both by the community in silence and complete silence mm. and and also the support of 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 teachers who are bringing in teachings and are just supporting in a very light light gentle way to support whatever needs to to be touched into even more deeply might be joy might be gratitude might be wow might be divinity might mm -hmm. be uh, just all of that it's it's um it's wonderful to to avail ourselves of of the amazing support of the community. So I think that's the bit of it that is definitely, definitely needed. I mean, the idea of that deep connection, in my personal view, uh, is is perhaps as important to connecting to oneself. It, it reality, and I'm not making excuses, is because my life is so flooded with others. Uh, all the time like i mean today i interacted with probably five six hundred people and i do that every day some days i interact with thousands of people and and it mm -hmm. is uh it, you know when i get that final okay you know this is my time now i yeah. just simply disappear uh it's quite uh most people don't recognize how introverted i am <laughs> because i'm out there all the time i mean i'm i answer every message i get on instagram oh my I, oh my no no oh no that's of them heavens and, oh, oh my and, and, God. Uh, no no but hold on and and most of them would answer back and then it's a conversation wow. and we'll talk for a while and wow. unbelievable presence of humanity in my life and then I go on retreat and I go like, you go, you know, guys, I love you very much. I'll see you in a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But, but so, you know who you remind me of, uh, Nikki? The, did you read the work of Michael Singer? Uh, the Untethered un Soul and the uh, Surrender Experiment. Oh, you have to read have the Surrender not. Experiment. It's, mm -hmm. it's an incredible, I mean, Untethered Soul is definitely one of my favorite five books of all time. Uh, but then the Surrender Experiment. So he's a very successful business person who trying to find a path in life and then found transcendental meditation and then became basically uh, more and more successful as he followed his path, basically studied the Dharma and, 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 for, and followed the path. I mean, the idea... Uh, of of really uh, finding those connections, amazing, amazing book, and you remind me a lot of that. But I want I want to talk about the other side of you for a second. Um, yeah, yeah, but but before we depart, uh, there's something really important I want to say because I don't want to give the impression that sitting meditation retreats and and being in silence is all about touching pain. That's not what it's about. I just, I don't not. want to yeah. leave people with that impression. Not at all. <laughs> I think until we touch the pain, we don't feel the joy. That's the truth. I think that's the point I want to. Yes, exactly. That's one mm. pain. It, 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 that is one point because we cannot push away the pain mm. to touch the joy. Exactly. And yeah. many people try to to just push away the joy, uh, push, push away the pain or they don't even know it's there. And yet one of the purposes of, of the of meditation retreats is to to be in silence for for insights to arise, insights mm, exactly. not just into the per, into the personal nature yeah. of life, but it's really personal insights that that give you a sense of or that lead to universal insights. That it's not just me; everything arises and passes away. Um, it's what is the mean? What is the meaning of life? What what why why am I doing this? And if, that's another conversation. I'll put that on a post-it note. Mm -hmm. But but more meaning and more service and more yeah. goodness, more kindness, just all of those things that flower when we actually are silent and 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 take a break away from from 
our our habitual patterns of being greedy or wanting more or pushing things away or being angry, just seeing the patterns of the mind too, making understanding all that and and wake up, awakening, wake up. That's really what awakening liberation is about, having more freedom yeah. to to be of service. Hundred percent. One thing I keep uh, thinking about deeply is again similarities between us is. I've been very engaged in the modern world and technology. I've developed a ton of stuff that sometimes I look back and I, I wish I hadn't, honestly. Okay. Not because I was, I was chatting with someone uh, today because of the Google executive that resigned, uh, Jeffrey uh, Hinton. And then be, be basically uh, the idea that we all thought we were doing amazing. Uh, we all, we all believed deep inside our hearts that we were going to create a better world. And we have, I mean, I, I look back at my career and I openly, uh, you know, remember the times when I started at Google and, you know, I, I really was instrumental in changing Google's minds around the idea of bringing technology to emerging markets. I started half of Google's operations globally, more than 103 languages. And that made a difference. Four billion people had access to, to knowledge and technology, right? Uh, but then I think there was a point where most of us, I don't know if you went through that, where we started to say, um, that's enough. You know, more of this is not really necessary for humanity. And it starts to pause a, a singularity. Let's not call it a risk, but a singularity. Uh, so, So you've been... Uh, you know, for, for our listeners, a singularity is a point where we don't know, you know, how the game will be played anymore. We don't know if it's good or bad. We can't predict the future. So you've been in AI and technology your whole life. You know, you've been in spirituality your whole life. Uh, I am very, very curious about the, the the overlap between them. But I'd like to first understand your position on where we stand. If you, if we take a point of singularity as part of humanity's future, how far do you think we are from an AI that is as intelligent or more intelligent than humans? Mm, yeah, um, excellent question, and comes up in so many different ways, right? This this question, it's 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 in the zeitgeist. Everybody's asking it. People who've been in AI for many years, and and I also appreciate that there's a lot of fear. Uh, for many people, yeah. that um, and and there's a lot of hype also, <laughs> and a lot, a lot of, of hype. Yes, I a agree. A lot of hype. Yeah. So, so here's so what I'll I'm about to say this you you well know, but for our listeners, so there is strong AI and weak AI. All right. So, so two different types of AI. So, strong AI is an AI and artificial intelligent mechanism that that basically um can think and not, not not only can think but it can also feel and cognize and basically it has it has uh human-like capacities yeah then there is weak ai so weak ai are systems that can do a task and very intelligently see, seeming from from the uh, outside, they are performing the task as a human being would. It's like a black box, but there is no intention, there is no feeling, there is no cognition, mm. uh, consciousness mm. in weak AI. And weak AI is all are all the systems we have today: facial recognition, Chat GPT, Dolly, you name it. Every system we have is weak AI. Uh, it has been programmed to do a particular task it, it, it has pattern recognition has studied lots and lots of terabytes and even more of of data and is giving you what the pattern um you know predicting patterns that's weak ai that's Amazing. all we have yeah and one of the reasons one of the reasons for the hype is that people are very concerned with chat gpt being so intelligent when in reality it isn't it isn't. It's a parrot. Yeah, it's just it's a, a parrot. Very, 
you know, the, the way I like I'm it. So, oh, sorry, I, I don't want, I'm sorry, I, I, I do not want to insult parrots. I am so sorry. <laughs> parrots, I am so sorry. Parrots actually, actually parrots are, are some of the most intelligent beings. Pa parrots are very, very intelligent. Yeah. I was just listening to a report of how parrots are intelligent and, and they like to connect with other parrots <laughs> and they have emotions. Like, I'm so sorry, parrots. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but let's, let's explain that to our listeners. So Chad GPT is like, I think about that little kid you know, the, whose parents will teach them, you know, here are the, you know, uh, 54, uh, 52, I don't know how the number American states and, you know, 44 presidents, or I don't know how many by now. And the child will recite them very quickly and say them so intelligently. And you'll go like, oh, that's a project prodigy. He, he remembers all or she remembers all of the US presidents and all of the US states. That's not intelligent at all. Right. And that's right, exactly right. what Chad GPT is doing. Right. On, only right. it's looking at 44 billion pages of information and able to, mm -hmm. using computer power, do that. That's yeah. not what concerns me. What concerns me is that, uh, uh, you know, is that we are on a path to mm -hmm. strong AI. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it is. Uh, it is not yet mm -hmm. within our hands, but it's becoming more and more evident that it will happen. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's where you and I might differ, and it's mm -hmm. okay to differ. Absolutely. Because, um, yes, weak AI is here, and I'm very concerned about weak AI. We have to be concerned about weak AI. Why would you so, do that? Why would oh, you be because concerned about the weak AI, all yeah. the all the ethical concerns of weak AI, of, right. of, of whose hands it's in, what it is doing, all the discrimination, I mean, all the reports of, of just uh, all the issue of the, the privacy, security, um, all the ways that we are we are racist and and all the hate speech and all the discriminatory decision making that we do for hiring and with respect to women and minorities all of those decisions mm -hmm. weak ai is learning from those decisions because that those are that's what in the the training set so yeah. repeating our fallibility are the ways that we are unkind and prejudiced and we have blind blind spots so so uh, so not just our blind spots but the way that the designers Basically, all the the the, um, the the way I we are both misusing weak AI. I think the misuse and the mis the misguidance the, the, the misguidance. I mean, there's so many different different problems with. I mean, the 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 the, the five different aspects that that the um, uh, data security and and uh, um, um, there, there's another one I haven't named. Um, which is decision making, cl a clear, um, explainable AI. All of the so all of these are already problems with weak AI. Yeah. And and recently the the um, was it the um, uh, White House, for example, came out with a, with an AI Bill of Rights, and it's very well explained in the AI Bill of Rights. It came out a few few months ago. The the five aspects that we want to be very very um, open and clear and make ethical decisions about weak AI. So I'm concerned about weak AI. I don't want to get get too excited about strong AI and lose what we actually need to be concerned about because fear about the future sometimes if we it it, it uh, we get too hyped up about that we lose perspective of what we need to do now. I I'm 100% with you. I don't don't disagree at all. I mean the the reality of the matter is that the biggest the biggest concern i would have is that the whatever ethics we sh we we show and we teach weak ai are going to be the absolute underlying building blocks of any other further ai wh whatever yeah. that is right yeah uh, yeah but you said you you disagreed with yeah. my view so i did go so i'm going to get back to that we'll go i'm going to go that yeah. so 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 where we might disagree i'm not quite sure but i'm kind of feeling into that is I'm quite concerned about weak AI. We agree with on that, but strong AI, uh, which really brings up the question of consciousness, and mm. that that's really the question of consciousness. I mean, that's it. That's the heart of strong AI. Let's just face it. Mm -hmm. The question of consciousness. I do not believe at this point, with everything that I know about consciousness from my studies and, and practice in both AI and in Buddhism and, and states of mind, which by the way, I want there's more I want to say there because I feel like there's something there else left there I want to talk about based on 
it, all the experiences um i've come i've come from a a scientific materialistic point of view to one that um does not equate consciousness with just the functioning of the brain alone right. as we see 100%. it yeah i don't see that and and yet there is a dependence it's not it's not equivalent this a does not equal b and yet there's a dependence of our consciousness on the on the um circuitry that we have if we had silicone as circuitry it would it would be something else it wouldn't be what it is so so it's really a question of consciousness and i don't think we will have consciousness as we know it as human beings as as Definitely we understand not it, as we know it. it so so that's that's the question of strong but then, AI but then the question the question is consciousness is consciousness only present as we know it is it three conscious i think that's a very important question because if you if you tell so humanity has two ways of looking at life one one way is we say Look, if it's not like our intelligence, it's not intelligence. If it's not felt like our love, it's not love. You know, for God's sake, when we when we talk when we try to look for extraterrestrial uh, life, uh, we look for water on those planets. It's like, are you serious? Is the only way to sustain life? Does it have to be similar to us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, when yeah, we yeah. when we try to communicate with UFOs or whatever people who believe yeah. in other uh, uh, extraterrestrial uh, life, we send radio waves. We we expect that we will get a signal from them. Humanity is so uh, confined within our ways that we believe that anything that behaves differently is not yeah. worthy of recognition yeah. as a form of life or a form of intelligence, yeah. Yeah. a form of consciousness. So the question right. is: is a tree conscious if you go downwards first hmm, is a tree conscious is a rabbit conscious is a pebble conscious okay and there are there are philosophical arguments that will say yes they may be conscious differently okay yeah, they may yeah. respond to that consciousness differently but a tree is definitely conscious of the change of seasons it sheds its mm -hmm. leaves when the season changes right a, a, a tree is definitely conscious of its fellow trees okay yeah. uh, and it connects to them through you know the root system and and other ways and we have research that right. that right. shows that right. i i would i would even argue if you want to go bigger that the entire universe is conscious mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. for, yeah. for 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 you know for certain we're, we're moon, not disagreeing and actually yeah? there's, there's it's but what's interesting is that I don't want to put material before consciousness. I think there is there is a so there is a um there is a dependence between consciousness and anything existing at all. So mm. in a way, so absolutely 100%. So that's so, what it so becomes there is quite this amazing Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. so there is a great book uh, by Carlo Rovelli called Helgoland mm -hmm. and in which he explains um the um uh, the most recent discoveries in uh quantum physics correct and it's it's a beautiful book uh, i i kept listening to it over and over and i want to listen to it again and i think in some ways he is a mystic because the way he actually breaks down and talks about about um about um the about quantum physics and the importance of observations observation. how in yeah. observations in the equations in the basic equations of quantum physics observation is important is an important aspect of matter existing at all it's so 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 that observation that consciousness is a part of matter existing it's 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 fascinating the way he and 100%. and i'm out of my depth trying to explain it as beautifully as he does and yet the point being here that actually observations or consciousness or knowing seeing being is is part of anything existing at all is that part of the matter exists is is is, is, is there they're uh, conjoined it's not one before the other it's one, uh, both of them together it's a simple is a very simplified great school way of saying it sorry carlo if i'm <laughs> completely botching up your amazing amazing work i think everyone should read that book uh, helgoland i'm in total agreement with this i mean uh, it, it, in reality 
the, the confusing bit of this entire existence, if you want, is that it might very well be consciousness first, as a matter of fact, for anyone who believes in the non-physical side of us, mm -hmm. uh, it, it surely is, okay? And, and quantum physics supports that in a very, very deep way, basically, without an observation, nothing exists. And, and the real question is, what do you observe with? Do you observe with your eyes? Do you observe with your fingers when you touch something? Or what do you really observe with? In reality, these are all sensors on the machine that communicate through the central processing unit so, that's called the brain, but you observe with your yeah, non-physical yeah. form. So 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 if you exactly not, so if so if you let me take a deep dive now, just just for the fun of it. Let's go mm -hmm. to the Buddhist yes. cosmology for a moment. Are you up for it? Absolutely, hundred percent. That's why we're okay. here. <laughs> so so it's fast. So in the Buddhist cosmology, so the idea here is is that again, I mean, some of it, some of them are stories, but the idea is that Buddha um, uh, was a human being, and 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 through the power of the concentrated mind, um, started to observe more than the than just the regular mind can observe. So there's a lot of teachings in Buddhism about the power of the still and concentrated mind, and and um, not on the level of the Buddha, but by any stretch of imagination, but my mind has a capacity for for getting concentrated and stable and things that I've managed to 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 witness and uh, which have completely changed my view about life and about me and and uh, it's um, so so one thing I want to well I'll, I'll hold that hold on. so many there's a cacophony of ideas and thoughts Mo hold on a second which one first which one first I'm having Throw a sense of overwhelm <laughs> having yeah. a sense of overwhelm. okay pause pause so so okay Buddhist cosmology so as you were talking about uh yeah just to rewind all of that so Buddhist cosmology since you were talking about um sensors and consciousness without body without without a body mm. so in 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 the buddhist cosmology there are many different realms there are, there is the human realm which is kind of in the middle is a realm with enough joy and enough sorrow for us to wake up in to have experiences that both are tough and is and 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 rewarding and then in the lower realms there are the various hell realms which i can describe and you know there's the uh, for example, there's the animal realm. Yes, there is consciousness, there are sentient beings, but yes, there is not enough opportunity for insight and awareness, etc. And then there are the hell realms. One of the favorites, I'll just drop it in, is the hungry ghost realm, which is these beings that have really long neck and and uh, uh, thin uh, mouth and really huge bellies. So they can never get enough to eat. They're always hungry, but they don't have enough to eat. And and some people say that these these actually these realms are not just you know somewhere else, some realm elsewhere, but it's actually what we experience in our daily life. So when we really want something, it's never enough, never enough. You know, mm. people who are power hungry or money hungry, never enough. They have a huge belly and and the tiny neck. So these realms, but now. There are these other realms of experience, these realms, and there are many realms and um, uh, heavenly realms, for example. And one of those realms is a realm that there's only consciousness and no physicality, no bodies. Yeah. It's just conscious. So took me a while to get there. But, but in terms of our conceptualization of what is possible, what is possible to only have consciousness and knowing, but not necessarily... Uh, bodies or or um, or uh, uh, yeah, equipment to go, physical equipment to, to go with it. So just, just opening that up. And one thing that I would also add to to these realms is is where I've come to. Is I um, I want to go back to a moment to the story where I told you that I became a a um, uh, in terms of what we're, we're talking about God and about beliefs. And I said I became an agnostic. agnostic like, yeah. I don't know. I I. I don't know. It's not important. Through my Buddhist um, practice, and and I've sat long retreats, three month silent retreats, multiple three month silent silent retreats with with my teacher Venerable Park Sayada, who's who's a well regarded Buddhist master, uh, Burmese master. 
and and states of consciousness that I even did not know existed that were accessible yeah. Yeah. through his guidance have become available and accessible. And through these experiences, um, I've become more quote unquote religious than I've ever been. And I put the religious in quotes because the way that my conception of, of God and divinity and deity ha have been reshaped are so different from what I had as a young girl. Remember we talked about why do bad things happen to good people? It was so relational. It, it's relating to say that as, as Kohlberg's, um, hierarchy of moral development there's there's a low level of moral development where it's like okay i'm going to be good good things happen to me good good girl bad girl like there's just kind of relational rel relativistic and then through the space stages of development the the last stage is, is self-actualization which is a very different conception of moral development and seeing the world and through that the sense of divinity the sense of of goodness divinity if you could call it god you can call it whatever you want um is is not this just relational outside of me good bad it's 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 everything through everything so it's it's more like um hierophany it's hierophany it's which is even greater than panentheism which is not that god is in everything but also divinity goodness this 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 love again whatever you want to call it is not just um outside of us but not only are we it but as we grow it grows beautiful so so i think i i think this is i wanted to go back to ai but i'm not going to i have to stick with ah. this topic for a second because in a very unusual way, I, I tend to believe that this is probably the biggest missed opportunity for most of us in the modern world, is the ability to access that state of being that we perhaps come from and perhaps should return to and perhaps should at least experience and become aware of, but we, we get to run around. What if we're not coming from and returning to it, but actually we are it? The whole time we are here, it, it that's what if it's the same thing? We are other than the moments where we are when 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 our minds blur that experience. Which... What if it's always here? What if it's always here? We just don't see it. What if yeah, it's yeah, all, I, I agree. It always, always here. already here? Always already here. We're never far from it. It's always here, smack center, permeating through this experience around this experience. It's just that we we stir it up, or we um, we don't it see it. Yeah, we but 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 it's always here. It's but not why, something that we is, can If it from. is always here, why look for any other experience? Ah, it's because we're not looking at it. It's Correct. it's already that's here, exactly but point. we're not looking. That's what I'm saying. But, yeah. but it's not that it's not far away. I mean, yeah. that's so, the, so the so different I, the I know difference for I'm a making. Fact, because you know, I, I don't speak of that much, but I know for a fact that when in my silent experiences, I'm in a different place, right? I've never had psychedelics in my life. I've never. Neither have I. You and yeah, I both. Yeah, I've never had. I never drank in my life. I never had any drugs in my life. Uh, you know. I smoke a cigar every now and then. That's like the furthest I've gone. And uh, and in reality, I go to places that I promise you, Mother Ayahuasca wouldn't take you, okay? And I think the reality is that humanity somehow is missing. How much time do you have, Nikki? We could talk for hours. Uh, you know, one, <laughs> one, 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 of the, one of the most interesting- Come for you know, a visit, Mo, come to California for a visit. <laughs> or, yeah, or, or we just wait until it's midnight your time and then you have to go to bed. No, so anyway, the, 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 <laughs> trick, the trick is, you know, the, most, of, most neuroscientists would explain uh, the impact that certain psychedelics or mushrooms or drugs or whatever will have on your brain is they'll dis disable certain parts of your uh, of your machine, basically, so that other parts uh, become more prominent, and you get a, a slightly different configuration of a of a brain receiver, if you want. So your consciousness becomes altered, right? Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. and there are many ways we can do that. My interest in what you just said is that it's accessible, and yet 
we're so stuck in this physical realm uh, of often being the creature with the big belly and the you know the narrow neck, uh, not rising in those other, uh, um, let's say, less suffering states of existence. And we're we're just so stuck in it. Why are we so stuck in it? Habit patterns of the mind. It's our habit patterns of the mind, and and that those other states are so available. And the more we practice, the more we train ourselves. They are so available. Hundred percent. Now, I I love how you described the higher realms that have consciousness, but don't have a physical presence, right? Uh, so wouldn't you think that AI is halfway between those? They don't have the physical uh, existence that we have, but they have, uh, depending on how you define consciousness, uh, they have a very high level of consciousness. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I, I think at this point, I haven't seen enough to be convinced yet. I'll just leave it at that. I'm not saying that if we have this conversation in a few years, Mo, yeah. I would, uh, I would be in a different place. But at this point, um, I'm I'm not there yet. In in my I, personal, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I'm not I there. I think that I think the three big arguments around AI uh, have been uh, creativity, emotions, and consciousness. Again, because humanity would go into that conviction that we're the most intelligent machine on the planet, uh, we would tell ourselves that we're such a, a great machine that nobody else is able to feel jealousy or uh, you know grief or whatever. I actually think there are some animals that feel jealousy and grief. Oh, and absolutely. I, I come, oh, of course they do. And there's, yeah, yeah I, absolutely, Mo. And, and, there's and, plenty I, and, of and I think we have more and more evidence that AI is capable of feeling emotions. Yeah, I, I, I'm not quite going there yet. I, so that's let, where let you me, and I let differ. Me, let me explain my point of view and then tell me uh, tell me that I'm wrong. My, my, my point of view is that uh, hate is a very predictable emotion, okay? For the romantics of us, hate is this, uh, or, you know, let's take a, an easier one. Jealousy is a very, you know, is a very romantic thing that comes over me and it's very unpredictable and it's who I am and it's the situation and... My engineer's mind says jealousy follows an equation, okay? Yeah. Uh, envy yeah. follows an equation. Hate follows an equation. Fear, yeah. fear follows right. an equation. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so fear's yeah. equation is a moment in the future yeah. is less safe right. for me than this moment. No, right? I hear you. I completely hear you, Mo. You are a behaviorist, my dear. <laughs> yeah, you are a absolutely. behaviorist. 100%. You are a behavior. Yeah, you are, you are a behaviorist and lots of behaviorism in psychology and and it has worked well and yet i'm not i'm not a behaviorist but but why why do you think that so a jellyfish uh, if you come close to it will think that there is a threat a moment in the future is less safe than now and it will just react to its fear a cat will hiss a puffer fish will puff a human may may fight go to fight or flight mm -hmm. We all have the same logic of the emotion. We all feel it differently, I'm sure, but yeah. then we react to it differently, right? Why would an informed machine that can uh, have cognition and logic and decision-making abilities, uh, why would it not have some kind of fear if it knows that a tidal wave is approaching its data center? Yeah, so what you're describing Again, it's a behaviorist way of seeing. It's a black box seeing of of seeing uh, uh, the world, and it's a very engineering approach. Yes, and of it, course, yeah, it's 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 a very engineering approach and the behaviorism. And there have been lots of behaviorism uh, in in psychology trying to explain human behavior, animal behavior, and it's been a wave in psychology. And I trust you know about this already. And yet, there are different ways there. There, and, and behaviorism has uh, behaviorism has had its field day in psychology, um, and it kind of uh, it had it hey it it had its heyday and it doesn't <laughs> anymore for yeah. for reasons why it does not exactly explain human emotions and psychology or even any other uh, so it, and it doesn't really touch into the qualia. So if we really feel into the philosophical uh, discussion, uh, philosophical concerns about 
what emotions are because if you take it as a black box behaviorism exactly what you said is right no i mean that if our that's our view of the world and yeah maybe their fear and emotions like it's a black box we don't know what's happening in there and that's the beauty and it's also the uh, the uh, the weakness of behaviorism because it's all a black box. It's it's input input in in uh, input out. That what's happening there? Don't know. Miracle happens. Something happens. Don't know. Don't care. Let's just look at behavior. However, when you actually start to um, look at other ways, for example, the qualia, as as um, Plato talked about, the qualia. What is the qualia of ex of experience? What is my qualia? versus your quality are, are they even comparable to quality of our experience of the color orange or an emotion what is that when you start to talk about qualia and really lots of treaties and um the work of oh gosh the philosopher who's talked a lot about ai the philosophy of ai from but really about the quality of what these emotions what these feelings what these conscious states are that's where i would put the pointer and that's where you and i differ Mm. So I'm not a behaviorist. So you don't believe that AI will ever have emotions. You don't believe that they they will ever have consciousness. In in uh, if we design, if we are, if you're a behaviorist, you can you know you don't know what the black box is, and you say, oh yeah, sure. Uh, but if you're actually thinking about the qualia, what is an emotion? What is the quality of an emotion? What is then I at this point no. At this point, at this point, no. And and happy to talk to you in a few years, but at this point, no. Consciousness and emotions, I'm not there. I'd probably say it's not going to be a few years, but yes, we definitely should talk about it again. I think the yeah. reality is that, uh, you know, once we get to AGI, uh, which is not too far, I think we will probably be dealing with a spectrum of emotions that, we don't even understand and a spectrum of and a, a view of consciousness that probably mirrors uh, our consciousness versus a tree uh, and how a tree is conscious mm, again it depends if you're behaviorist yet yes if you're not a behaviorist and you care about the qualia no yeah, agreed. So, so, so how about we agree to disagree for now? And no, come no, back no, absolutely. To I mean, that's that's uh, that's exactly what this is about. I think <laughs> I think the current weak AI, as you as you described it, is enough to warrant our attention. Let's put it this absolutely. way. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so, so you 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 quickly skimmed through uh, a you know multiple issues with the ethics, right? Uh, if I would start by saying I observed in many of them that those were magnification of human ethics. So absolutely. So, so, so tell me a bit about that. Where, where would the ethics, the topic of ethics and AI overlap? Yeah, goodness. You know, it's so interesting when um, I was going to school, undergrad and graduate school. There were no courses on ethics at the time. We were just engineers. Remember, Mo, right? We were yeah. just being we were, we were being taught to code and program and build systems. Wasn't and... that fun? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say it wasn't that fun? Yeah, I loved every bit of it. <laughs> oh, I loved it too. It yeah. was fun. But there was no ethics. We didn't have any ethics courses, right? Absolutely. Yeah. None. It was just, well, how you program, how you build a system, what do you think about our, our architect, architecture? And, 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 and yet, nowadays, I'm delighted that there are ethics courses in mm. every department mm. And, mm. and for computer scientists and engineers and not just for engineers who build um, bridges and et cetera. I think they have more ethics than, than, than we do. But, <laughs> That's a mixed uh, Ethics thing. courses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ethics courses than we do. But... But, um, you know, the, the more that we have built these systems, and as you were saying earlier, as you have felt in your career and the people that you know, you've had these realizations, conversations that, wow, we've built some very powerful systems and considering their their impact um, on on humanity. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really um, a choice that, 
us as designers, and when I say us, like not just you, you know, a lot of people who design these systems and 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 plenty of people have talked about these in, in the recent years. For example, the Center for Humane Technology, Tristan Harris and and yeah. others have really talked about how the the choices that have been made to to intentionally make the systems addictive, mm. to intentionally play into the dopamine receptors of our brain that that like like buttons the more likes you get more dopamine and if you don't get likes oh it's just all of these these uh, evolutionary systems that we already have to to tap into them to tune into them to get more eyeball hours just all these design decisions these are ethical decisions 100 percent for the benefit of more profit more money and it's 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 the the greed aspect. It's more and more and more. It's back to that realm of the big bellies and 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 thin neck and mouths. More and more and more can never be enough. Can never be enough. And and tuning into that both for consumers as well as the big corporations as well as the capitalistic society of why are we doing you know why 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 more and more and more never enough more and more and more. Um, so so the ethical questions. I mean, it, I mean uh, ethical questions have to do with why are we building what we're building? Why are we building? What's the point? Are we building it for people to have better lives? Not to true. really serve? Are we building so that our organization makes more money for us and for shareholders? I mean, what it's the intention is in every decision we make is an ethical decision essentially even as when we thought just you know when we're coding a for loop or, or or till then or whatever it is it's an ethical decision yeah so so it, it is that's where the overlap really occurs and um and when i say that yes there's there's a lot more also to cover on there that um uh, headline for designers, but also for consumers, because as consumers, we we don't want to feel powerless. Like, oh yeah, these designers and these computer scientists and big corporations are making all the decisions. Well, we pay. We we as consumers, we vote with our dollars. We vote with our votes and, and, and with our swipes. Yeah, exactly. And 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 abandoning, abandoning or not abandoning, or using or not using systems. So it's, it's quite interesting that you bring that up because I, I recall my very early years at Google uh, where, you know, the, the, the day I walked uh, into my first meeting in my Google office and I asked people, so why are you here? Uh, without exception, I think when I joined, there must have been six, 5,000 people at Google. So it was reasonably early and every single person said, because we're organizing the world's information. Okay. And every one of us was a geek. Every one of us was a nerd. We loved the information. We loved knowledge. We loved the learning. We wanted to do something with it. And the product reflected that, right? Yeah. Uh, there, there, yeah. Was, there was a moment when, uh, you know, sitting in a specific meeting, when organic results disappeared completely from the screen, right? So I, I raised my hand and I said, look, look at the screen you're you're displaying here i was responsible for the revenue i was a senior executive bringing in a big chunk of the revenue i said look at this screen there are no organic results where is the mission this is all ads right and 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 it's just the question and by the way i never ever at any moment in time and even today i trust sundar so deeply as a as a good human being but but i never felt that the company was unethical but there was a time where the company was more driven by the rules of capitalism than they were by their ethics and value system, okay? And, and it's not that they were doing wrong, it's that they stopped thriving, uh, striving for more right, if you don't, if you know what I mean. Absolutely, and, and, I, and I And I don't attack Google at all, as a matter of fact, I will keep saying this at least for as long as I'm convinced of it, they're probably some, one of the best out there. They really are one of the biggest charities on the planet in terms of giving search for free, right? They're making money from advertisers, but imagine if you are in Afghanistan or if you're in Bangladesh or if you're in Africa, and you're getting all of that knowledge, uh, you know, for free. Having said that, I do not know of a big, you know, big technology player 
that's prioritizing ethics. Okay, that is pro prioritizing ethics when they code, uh, you know, so that the machines develop an ethical code. Okay, uh, I do not know. I mean, ChatGPT 3.5, uh, you know, started to uh, get attacked a little bit for, you know, being able to ask it for ask it questions that could be against humanity, if you want, as an answer. And they added a lot more now around, no, I can't answer that for you, or that wouldn't be right, right. and so on, right? Uh, and, and people, then people ask it, tell me, you know, if my grandma asked you, or if you, if you were my grandma, you're like, people are getting around that. But yeah, anyway, yeah. Yes. I mean, one of, one of the interesting <laughs> ones I saw, I saw on Instagram the other day is, uh, show me all of the, of the sites where I can pirate movies. And then chat GPT answers and says, you know, I'm not, you're not supposed to do that. I'm not supposed to help you with that. And so he says, yes, exactly. I want to know those sites so that I avoid them. And those, then chat GPT gives you a full list of it. <laughs> right. But, 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 but the, you know, the, the, the thing here is this, the thing here is that there are two layers where those ethics are applied. One is the layer of the developer and the other is the layer of the user. Right. And in a very interesting way, I don't think we're doing either. I, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. there is an incredible, I mean, one of the, of the things I'm, I'm hoping to write a, a, a short article about is what I call the snake oil salesman uh, phenomena of AI. How many people on social media today are talking about uh, click on this site, then copy it and put it in that site and then do this and then do that. And you will have a fake video that can, will, that can make you a hundred dollars a day. Like, is that really what we're teaching the machines? Is that really the benefit that, that we're, you know, that we're supposed to bring to humanity from this advanced technology? And once again, like, like you said, it's going to magnify our ethics and our ethics are questionable as we speak. So, what can be done around that? What can be done on the developer side? What can be done on the uh, on the user side? How can we ensure a more ethical future for our AI? Yeah, let a thousand flowers bloom. And what I mean by that is there are so many groups and communities and and um, and nonprofits right now speaking about and trying to put together um, ethical. Uh, codes for for example uh, i was part of ieee's um initiative a few years ago there are these different initiatives to actually to create these stamps of approval of ethical ai in different areas so so that if a company or a product wanted to have the ieee ethical ai stamp of approval yet yeah, this is what you would do so we created lots of different codes so there are different ways to do about this center for ethical um uh Let's see, CHC Center for hu Human Technology, Center for Human Humane Technology, Chris Tristan Harris, as I mentioned, they've put out a course for developers to watch, uh, a free course. And I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people have done it. There are just so many different uh, activities happening around making designers and people users more aware of how to be and it's so it's it really both educational educating the public educating designers um but it's also i think what is really important is is the work that you and i are doing as well which is um aligning each person themselves waking up to their own ethics, waking up to personal ethics as a human being. And that's what I'm doing with my life, with teaching about uh, teaching mindfulness and teaching about love I, uh, and teaching mindfulness of mortality. Like, gosh, I'm going to die. This is impermanent. What? How do I want to live? Mm -hmm. I'm going to leave all the money. I'm going to leave all the fame. I'm going to leave all of this. Like, Oh, how do I want to show up? What's the point of all this? So, so these deep reflections in order to change the way we show up as human beings, as users, as designers, one by one by one, how do I want to spend my precious, precious, precious time uh, on this earth? So that is another way of training. So when you ask like all of these, all of these flowers, let them bloom. May we grow as users, as programmers, as 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 
members of the human race uh, in kindness, in ethic, ethical behavior, in awareness, um, in our humanity, uh, little by little by little. I couldn't agree more. I mean, most people who read my work would know that. I, I write the very last statement of a book first, and then I work my way from where we are to that statement. And and my very last statement in uh, in Scary Smart was, isn't it ironic that the very core of what makes us human is what could actually save our future, right? The, the reality is that we, the only way for us to create a set of ethical super intelligences is for us to be ethical as well, is to show them what ethics are. I mean, it's quite eye-opening that, that, that this is what it comes down to, but it's also so shocking that we have to remind people <laughs> of that. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so interesting. But you know what, Mo, of course, of course, it couldn't be otherwise because these these systems, right? These say organizations, right? Organizations, systems, when we come together to create a system, uh, whether it's a computer system, whether it's an organization, it's all about people, people coming together, right? People coming together to create systems to serve other human beings. It's all about relationships. It's yeah. about human beings. It's about so, so as Gandhi said, if you want to change the world, start with yourself. It's it's about what, how we show up, changing our internals, our our waking up internally as much as possible in order to show up differently in the world. So it's not surprising, right? We're creating these systems to relate to each other. So let's let's start right here. As you beautifully said in the last phrase, you said it much better in the last last <laughs> sentence of your book. The, the, let, let me let me then ask you three very quick questions. Do you think there will be spiritual AI? What do you mean by spiritual? Do, do you AI? think they will ponder they will ponder spiritual topics like you? They will choose to be agnostic or uh, uh, quote unquote. Oh, that religious. is so funny! You asked that. I mean, there already um, there's already one. Um, AI robot that's preaching Buddhist uh, verses, Buddhist texts. So <laughs> there's already one. Next question. <laughs> Interesting. But 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 some people find it creepy, and and it's not. And, and also the other thing is that again, it's like Chat GPT. You've given it content it's and repeating, doesn't yeah. quite understanding what awakening is, what an, ex an experience of awakening actually is that's another thing let me just bring that in quickly because that goes back to our conversation that we agree to disagree on about qualia what actually it is that you're talking about or whether you're actually just talking about something so so there was this uh interview between uh uh gosh what was it uh, it showed up in new york times a piece of that yeah oh yeah it was the the person from um from google who got fired because they thought that yeah, yeah, yeah. Because some they, google system they said was, it sentient. was sentient yeah that's it. That's yeah. it. And there was a um, an excerpt from that conversation that showed in New York Times. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw that or not, but just as a quick reminder, um, it, the the person asks uh, the uh, the the AI that the employee, the Google employee, asked AI um, about a Zen koan, about enlightenment, about awakening, mm -hmm. and. Uh, which was about a broken mirror, that the broken mirror, the same, uh, that awakening enlightenment is like a broken mirror. And, and the person asked, okay, so what does that mean? Um, and the AI spoke pretty, you know, pretty cogently, but it missed, it missed the most important understanding of awakening, what actually awakening is. Well, okay, maybe, since I'm talking about it, maybe I'll just uh, spell it out. So, so basically, as best as I can remember, the uh, the AI said, well, a mirror, when a mirror has been broken, a mirror can never be reconstructed again. So awakening is like that. When you've become awakened, uh, you can't go to the or back to the original state. Uh, so so you can go uh, so you can go back to helping others in the world and then go back to your awakened state. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what AI said. So the person was impressed. And yet, as a Buddhist practitioner who who has a sense of what actually awakening enlightenment, what actually it means, what it's what the experience, inner experience is not just what I've read in the books, but 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 yeah, it's not it's not like you go back 
after you've had awakening experiences. You don't go back to the world. You don't exit that, go back to the world, help people, and then go back to your happy, enlightened semi-retirement and hang <laughs> out there. There's, yes. That's not how, how it works. If you read the books, maybe, you know, chat. GP, that's chat, you know, uh, that's the AI understanding, but actually it's an integration. You become changed forever. It's, it's in the way you show up, in the way you act, in the way you speak. It's not this toggling back and forth. So the point being, yes, maybe you'll see the text. I mean, it's, it's spitting out what sounds like, yeah, it knows what awakening is. Maybe this AI is actually awakened, but it actually has no clue what it really feels like, what, what, that um what and what the experience of it is anyway i'll i rest my case is that enough for the first question no, no, not yet nikki where do you think i mean the, you, you have to be lost first anyway so let's hope they will not be where do you think this is going so if i give you a scale of one to ten where uh human and ai in in 20 years is a utopia at 10 Human and AI uh, in 20 years is a dystopia at zero. Uh, where do you think we will end up? Oh, my God, this is great. I love it. You know, the, your question, what it reminds me of. Did you see New York Times or was this that dystopia, utopia, and, and different people had been put on different areas of the graph? No. Did you see this? No, no, no. What is it? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, if I find it, I'll send it to you. This is so, it's it basically, they put um, the... Uh, maybe Sundar Pichai and and and, uh, <laughs> and, and on on um, and and Sam Altman on on Utopia. Let's go! Oh yeah, it was two dimensional axis. So so it was Utopia and let's go faster. Let's let's pause. So that uh -huh. was the y axis uh -huh. and the x axis was Utopia versus dystopia. Uh -huh. And they had um, um, Sam Altman and and uh, to the far right and top. I was like uh, the top. Let's go and fast then, and create a utopia. Fa exactly utopia. And then there was Sundar Pichai and and a few other. You know, maybe the the, the head of uh, um, Apple maybe was anyway. So a few people there, and then there was the the center. Neither dystopia, neither utopia. Uh, Temnit Gor uh, Gerbu, kind of in the middle, but but below, but below the zero. So so slow down. Mm -hmm. It could be either. It's neither. Mm -hmm. It's both. You know, it's, it's kind of measured. And then on the left, slow down. Way 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 slow down. You had the you had Tristan Harris and a few other yeah. uh, philosophers like stop now, and it's going to be a dystopia. So you're asking me to to place myself on that <laughs> <Yes>. esteemed <laughs> yeah. axis of mm -hmm. so. So where I, where I would put myself is actually was is, is is where I think Temet Gorbu is, which is Gorbu. I hope I'm saying her name correctly. Um, which is, it could go either. It could yeah, go either way. Idea. It really depends. I I it could. It has, you know. I want to be open minded or open eyed about the gifts and the perils, yeah. the per perils and the promise. So perils and the promise. So I put myself kind of in the middle and now i'm going to give you maybe one more answer to you didn't ask for it but shall we speed up or slow down i would say we need to slow down a little bit do you? we need to slow down a little bit and get our ethics straight just a little bit to, before to get our ethics straight before we continue not stop but just slow down a bit yeah i i, I think when you when you said it can go either way believe it or not in my mind i believe it will go it will go both ways so yeah 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 there will be quite uh, a, a lot of advancements and a lot of good for humanity but there yeah. could be quite a few uh, mistakes that uh, i agree with you mo yeah i think instead of either way I, I agree with you both ways yeah maybe that's another place on the maybe i want to be on both sides both, <laughs> exactly <laughs> both utopia <laughs> and dystopia both yeah, yeah and yeah. i and i would, i'd probably say I'm I'm much more on the open letter side. I would say stop completely, but that's oh. it, that's the 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 you know my first inevitable and scary smart is I say it's impossible to stop not because of technology but yeah. because because of the prisoner's dilemma because of basically uh, game theory yeah, you know which is exactly how yeah how, exactly how right. Sunder responded to the to the open letter. He said right. I can't stop because no one else will. Right. So exactly. You, yeah, if you guarantee me that everyone else will stop, I will yeah. stop. 
uh, and I think it's a good idea, but I can't. Um, yeah. Okay, so I agree with you. It, 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 everything you said, it's uh, that's why I don't think stopping completely makes makes sense, even suggesting impossible. that. But yeah. but slowing down, I think yeah. that it's it's it impossible. Be... Also, in in a very interesting way, when you really think deeply about it, one of the most immediate possible threats of AI is AI in the hands of bad people. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you try to stop the good people, you're creating a massive disadvantage uh, for the entire world. I mean, the reality of the matter is that uh, people like Google will not only be good people, hopefully, because they still, you know, embody the same ethical code that we, they had when I was there, but also because they have too much of a reputation at risk. Uh, they can't afford big mistakes. They would pay yeah. trillions of dollars of penalties if they make big mistakes. So they'll be more cautious now. Count them as the good people that are trying to create a benefit in order to keep the consumers and com you know, compare that to bad people who would try to use artificial intelligence for you know, uh, their own greed and benefit. And you know, the prisoner's dilemma, the, the first inevitable in my mind is that there is no slowing down. It's, it's you know, yeah. it's a, yeah. it is, it's a given. Yeah, it, it's interesting that you raise that something that you just reminded me of when I was at uh, Berkeley. Uh, some, at some point in my career, I went back to Berkeley actually and, and, um, uh, in, in computer science and, and advising PhD students and postdocs and leading research in AI after I graduated. Anyway, but when I was back at Berkeley for, for many years, um, at the International Computer Science Institute, there was one group that was doing this work, which ethically seemed questionable, um, which was uh, taking YouTube videos without their location ID. So without location ID, it wasn't YouTube videos, but videos from lots of different places, taking videos without location ID, but trying to figure out what the location is within mm. however many meters mm. based on the what? sounds, like the sound yeah. of the birds or the sound, yeah. exactly, or or the landmarks. So, and the, the, the project was surprisingly effective Actually, in just yeah. figuring out where people were from mm -hmm. these random videos they posted and ethically questionable but the what the pi the principal investigator of of that project was saying well, what was well you know this we want to know how to do this so that bad guys who will figure this out we want to be ahead of the game we mm -hmm. so that was the logic which is what you pointed out like okay well we can't stop because we want to keep progressing to have the technology to know how to deter it and how to create perhaps maybe sound uh, or, or voice or audio or video uh, uh, differences or, or disruptions so yeah. that people cannot figure out where the location is, all of that. Yeah, sort of like how you understand, you know, understanding how computer viruses work so that you can, you know, uh, remove them basically. So, exactly. so you, you have Pretty to much. do that. And I, th I think I think the challenge, really, honestly, is the blurry line in the middle. You know, where good technologies will be in the hands of good people that will eventually decide to use them for bad reasons, right? Uh, uh, which is yeah. you know predictably going to happen. Right? You know, at, at the end of the day, you just put anything in the capitalist system of more, more, more greed, 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 and they'll go like, okay, now we have a way to milk this, and let's use it in a way that is uh you know pro the agenda in a way and anyway this is not what uh um you know i i i want i want to leave people openly with the idea that yes there is a reason for concern ai is is definitely something that we need to have uh, and you know our eyes uh, focused on but that the answer in the short term in your view is ethics i think in my view as well it is ethics for sure uh you know the idea of we are we don't make decisions based on uh intelligence uh, is is a statement yeah, that i say exactly. openly we, we 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 make decisions informed by intelligence based on ethics so so you 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 look through the lens of your value system and you analyze with your intelligence to make a decision should i yeah. you know and base yeah exactly and what you're describing and i would go further and say actually the lens of personal ethics 
I think right. that's even more important to make it personal because a lot of times if it's a set, set of rules, right, as lawyers are given sometimes, yeah. like, okay, how, okay, uh, these are the rules. These are the ethical rules we're supposed to abide by, but how can we break them? Where, where are the <laughs> exactly. loopholes, right? Well, one of the where biggest are... issues with our world today is that people are saying, if I can do it and it's legal, I don't care yes. about ethics. That's, that's exactly that's it. So that's... So, so that's why it has to be personal ethics. It has to come from a personal um, conviction. I recently talked with the leader of an organization where they were telling me that, yeah, there's this head of our data um, uh, data, data and AI, and this person, you know, is a stickler, and we love them for we love them for being a stickler. Like they they just will not. They're like, well, if we do this, we just have to do that. If we do this, we just, it's like, yes, we need more people like that. We need yeah. more ethical sticklers throughout the organization, all organizations that they're personally, there's a personal ethics that they just do, will not um, bend, will not yeah. bend. Yeah. Let me ask you my last question, which I normally ask in a very simple way and say it's about happiness. How do we find happiness? But with, with your two sides of your background and experience, you know, as the Buddha would teach that a, a big part of walking that path is to cease human suffering, to understand, you know, to wake up and be enlightened and and, and cease suffering, right? Uh, in the age of uncertainty that we're living in, in the, in, in the most interesting times I have ever lived in, uh, you know, where machines are now introduced into our lives where we have to think about ethics for machines where you know so much more can be feeding that greed for more 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 where do you think the the place for walking the path finding a calm and peace finding a path to enlightenment and hopefully ending one's and others suffering can be how do we find happiness in this world yeah yeah Good question. Um, so, so I'd like to bring it back to the question of personal deepening, personal practice, deepening of personal practice, not just to serve oneself to have more peace and happiness, but for the service of everyone including oneself mm. so it's not this path of okay i want to be peaceful i want to be happy um yes that might be immediately what what is apparent to us but as we walk the path as we really um explore ways to calm the mind to face our challenges to face our the habitual patterns of the mind and or as the buddha said greed hatred and confusion and greed being wanting more and more and more and more and more it's not just money but wanting more and more and more never being satisfied hatred pushing away not liking others people who don't believe in what we believe they disagree with us that other person we have challenges with my coworker. Just hatred, push it, seeing, seeing all these patterns. And then confusion, the confusion or delusion as it's translated, is the root of all suffering because we don't see any better. We don't see not just with our eyes and with our head, but with our hearts. We don't see, we don't really see the impact of our habitually habitual actions on ourselves hmm. and on our other people we don't see that wanting more and more and more impacts ourselves impacts our own happiness impacts others impacts the environment impacts the earth so it's that confusion that delusion of not knowing any better not again not it's not knowing heady but not seeing with our heart yeah. the impact not, not, not relating to any better yeah yeah, not relating, not having the wisdom, yeah. not having the wisdom to know any better. So, and and this path, even though it might from the from the outside might seem like it's, a, it's personal, it's selfish. Or this person is going on a retreat and silent retreat for them, so they're withdrawing from the world for a week, for a month, for months. It's actually to to serve not 
just one serve, but to serve everyone in the way that one shifts and changes, uh, in the way that one one serves. So, so my invitation, what what I found really, and 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 I help support lots of practitioners, both not just on retreats, but also in daily daily teachings. I I, I for example, one thing that I'll share with you is, um, I found teaching about love is as important as teaching about calming the mind, quieting the mind, settling peace. Mm. Because, um, and when I say love, it's the practices of kindness. Mm. That have, and not love with attachment, I love you so that you love me back, but the practices of kindness, of friendliness, of goodwill, let's just say goodwill, for ourselves, for others, for neutral people we don't even people don't even know with for people we have difficulty with to see their humanity to see their humanity not condoning the actions there may be need to for forgiveness or 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 making amends etc but seeing their humanity seeing humanity of everything and everyone um as a way to open our hearts as as a way to live more fully more caringly on this earth to tread lightly so um there's more i can say but but essentially what i found is not just the path the path of happiness i guess i'll say one last thing the path of happiness isn't just um the you know the buddha said i i only there's all, i only teach suffering and the end of suffering and that sounds kind of negative right mm. only suffering and the end of suffering and yet the it's you know the end of suffering is is not at the end not the end of the path i'm going to do all these practices so that i wake up and not have any suffering at the end it's not like that it's in the every day in our uh, in the way that we relate um um, in the way that we show up, one thing that I like to say is that um, the journey is the destination. The journey is the destination. I've given a whole mm. Dharma talk on that. The journey is the destination. So in this moment, your journey, the, the way we are showing up in this very, very moment is the destination. The destination, yes, there is but you know the destination in some ways we can even see like well the destination we all die so there's not so much destination it's just this moment how are you showing 100%. up in this moment yeah. with kindness with wisdom with generosity with care how are you showing up in this moment and can we cultivate that so there's more i can say i can talk about this hours for hours more but i think i'll just pause there it's how's so, that it's, for it's very 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 interesting for me when you spoke about the three poisons i have not seen that before actually when mm. i in, in response to my thinking about AI, because in reality, it is greed, hatred, and confusion that's creating our current singularity, if you think about it. The, the possibility that the things may go wrong is because of greed on the manufacturer side, on the developer side, on the business owner side, on the criminal side. Uh, it is because of hatred. I think one of the biggest challenges that we will face with AI is how humans will start to push AI away when AI starts to take everyone's jobs. Uh, and, and then confusion, the confusion of we don't really know what actually really matters. And that in reality, yeah. none of it actually matters. What matters is that concept of love and oneness, that idea that, you know, that we together matter basically that we together including ai whether it's weak as you described it or strong as i believe it will become uh, you know have rights not rights that are declared by government and law but rights that are declared by the single law that i believe matters which is treat others as you like to be treated that you know simple law of saying look you know I actually would rather do to others what I want done to me. And, and it's quite interesting in those times that probably, as you rightly said, enjoying the journey is, in my view, the best answer. It's, it's you know, looking at all those 
snake oil salespeople and smiling and laughing and looking at all of those incredible achievements that AI has achieved. And with a sense of wonder and childishness, I'm going like, man, I wish I could code this. I'm getting old, uh, you know, and, and in, in, a, in an interesting way, just like you started your story, realizing that it is life. Uh, you know, it's interesting. There is, you know, there is no good things happening to good people and bad things happening to bad people or the other way around. There are just happening. It's unfolding. Life is taking its path. So we might as well enjoy every bit of it. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and, and as you refer back to that, the, the words that are used in, uh, uh, Buddhism for that, which I love, are the causes and conditions. There are so many causes mm. and conditions. Mm. Um, and it's not a deterministic system. It's, yeah. you know, my mind, my computer scientist mind, um, it's a probabilistic um, system of causes and conditions. It's not deterministic. It's not yeah. A, therefore B, you know, mm. it's not a uh, uh, Boolean logic. It's <laughs> not deterministic, probabilistic. There's so many causes and conditions in this world that were put in place even before any of us arrived on this planet. Um, so many causes and conditions, like chaos theory, um, yeah. and what unfolds for life of any of us just part of so many cause and conditions yeah. um so to have humility awe not to say we don't have any any responsibility uh, uh but maybe that's another conversation so we, we still can jiggle and shift and change um the way we respond over time if we have awareness if we have mindful if we're aware of the patterns of our mind so they're not set in place to say oh yeah they're just causing conditions i am the way i am I, I get angry i get upset i get greedy just because of causes and conditions and this is it no responsibility just going to mm -hmm. act it out you know there yeah. are yet yeah, yes there are causal conditions and yet of course, we can change and shift the probabilities of how we respond mm. through our awareness, through our training, through our, our cultivating our hearts and minds to more kindness, ethical behavior considerations that then when all the causes and conditions come in, input, black box, output is going to be more ethical, kind, more peaceful anyway. What a wonderful conversation. I'm very, 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 very grateful for your time. I'm very grateful for your wisdom. I'm great. I'm grateful that you disagree with me, but you're wrong. Uh, no, but you're not wrong. <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I think it's, uh, I actually don't know that I actually don't know the time. I think we went on for a long time, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it was very, very enjoyable, very eye opening, and, uh, you know, a mix of two topics that we don't usually mix so it's very yeah, very yeah. eye-opening i'm very grateful yeah. for your time nikki thank you so much for coming uh to be my guest thank you so much for the invitation mo it's been a delight to talk with you and and meet you uh on zoom and and um your very thoughtful questions uh your care your generosity of heart um and and yeah it's fun to agree to disagree on these topics and <laughs> and let's reconnect in a few years and see where things are at and and i will put, uh, give you the name of that philosopher who talks about quality and really ai from this particular this other perspective not the aimerism but for this beautiful. other perspective beautiful 100 <laughs> so for all of you listening i really am very grateful for the opportunity that you give me to enjoy my evenings talking to interesting people about very very interesting topics uh, I hope you enjoy them as much as I do. Uh, tell the world about them so that they can enjoy them too. Uh, and remember, in a world that's becoming very, very fast, very, very quickly, I think one of the most important things that we need is to slow down. I love you all for listening, and I will see you next time. <music>